Hello, everybody. This is Dr. Dan Cortelicchio. I want to welcome you to another segment of Destination Health Podcast, where we're finding function in a dysfunctional world. We really have a very special guest on today. We're just getting to know each other. We're becoming friends. We spoke, wants to come on to our podcast. There's so much here that I want to talk to with several mirrors. This is going to be a great conversation. So what I want everybody to do is sit down because this is a conversation that you're going to want to hear everything that we have to say, because Cheryl has been through hell and back, and she is an inspiration. And We're just getting to become friends, and she's an inspiration to me because of what she has gone through in her life. And she's a fellow Northern New Jerseyan. She's a fellow North Jerseyan. That's why we get along so well. That's why we get along so well. So, you know, I'm from North Jersey, as you all know. So Cheryl, welcome to the program today. I'm a little hoarse today, but that's okay. Welcome to our show. How are you today? I'm doing very well. I really um, appreciate the opportunity to be on the show and talk about my experiences and, and hope to inspire and give hope to people. Yeah, thank you very much for saying yes, because when we were talking originally and I said, you know, Cheryl, you got to come on to the show, you know, and, you know, yeah. there's just so much to talk about. But anyway, Cheryl, she is in IT for over 30 years, chronic illness warrior. That's going to be our first question for 35 years, cancer survivor for four years, IFBB bodybuilding pro since 2018, true passions are her children her inner circle of friends, bodybuilding, inspiring others to keep hope alive, sharing her journey on how bodybuilding and nutrition have helped her overcome her chronic illnesses. Although she got her pro card in 2018, her most cherished awards are the Val Jensky Inspiration Award, which she got in 2019, and the 2021 Harrison Hamp Inspiration Award. This is within the bodybuilding community. I have in my mind right now, Cheryl, 50 questions. And I'm just going to start off with, let's go to the chronic illness. Yes. What happened? When did it start? What is this all about? Um, well, they ended up diagnosing me with ulcerative chronic colitis, mm -hmm. which basically affects your entire colon. And it started when I was around 19. And I remember um, I got my first job. I was traveling going out to dinner, having a few drink. Well, I'm not supposed to drink at 19, but you know, I had a few drinks, you know, things like that. And I just remember um, after um, being at a conference all day working, going out um, with my fellow workers, I just didn't feel good. I would eat and then I just wouldn't feel good. And I would go to my hotel room and just something was up. I, I just can't really explain it, but just didn't feel good. And that lasted maybe a year or so. Mm -hmm. And it progressively got worse um, to where I had a lot of bleeding, stomach issues. Mm -hmm. My whole world just changed overnight. And then when they finally diagnosed it, they said, um, this is what you have. There's not a lot of treatment options back then. Uh, mm -hmm. There were a few kind of pills, but after the pills don't work, the only thing you can really do is have your colon removed. Um, that Back then, that's all there was. So I think I lasted 15 years that way. Um, it got to the point where I always had to be by a bathroom, uh, lots of pain. Lots, I was in the hospital almost every month with just different uh, pains in the stomach and so it was around uh, 2001, I had uh, my six month old and my son was about a year and a half old. And I would take, and, and this may, makes me cry, but I would take them home from daycare. And as I'm getting them out of their car seats, what do kids do? Hold me, mommy, 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 hold me. Okay. Sure, of course. So I get my daughter, I get my son and and I'm, I'm the whole kid, I'm holding these two kids and I'm going towards the door. The pressure of holding my two babies, I would lose my bowels. Uh, I'm embarrassed to say, but every time I would hold them, I would lose my bowels mm -hmm. and they would laugh. I mean, they're children, they're supposed to laugh. <laughs> they go, oh, mommy did it again and we'd all have a good yeah, laugh. Yeah, they're not, you know, Cheryl, Cheryl, they're not. I mean, that must be hysterical <laughs> to a two or three year old. Oh, look at mommy. You know? My goodness. It, it was. And throughout all of my, my I won't say career, my life with a chronic illness, 
I've instilled laughter in my children because there's going to be hard, hard times. And my opinion is that laughter is the best medicine. Mm -hmm. So we would laugh about it. We'd be at the front door and we'd laugh, but inside I was crying because what kind of life can I have if I can't hold my own two babies? And that was the decision I made then is to have my colon removed, to have some kind um, of life. So you had your, you had your colon removed. I had my whole, my whole, sorry, I'm starting to cry. My entire okay. colon removed in, um, 2000, at the um, end of 2002. How old were you at that point? 35-ish? Around 35, yeah. And it's not common for someone to elect to have their colon removed. Mm -hmm. um, and when I went to the doctor, I, I had a rare form of ulcerative chronic colitis because you have four quadrants of your colon. And usually it affects one or two parts. Mine was in all four parts mm -hmm. at the highest stage it could be. So there really wasn't any coming back. It was very aggressive, mm -hmm. um, the form that I had. So um, they took the colon out. Unfortunately, the operation did not go well. I went, after a week, I went septic. I ended up back in the hospital and I almost died. So I was in there for probably about six months um, trying to recover. And of course, obviously I did recover, but it was one of the hardest. Well, I thought at the time that was the hardest journey I ever went through until June of 2020, when I almost lost my life from an intestinal twist and now have a permanent ileostomy. Right. What was that like for you? I mean, you know, you're, you're, I mean, you're in your 20s. Listen, on, on our show, as you can see, we're not going to talk about your macros and micros just yet. I mean, you know, maybe. Oh, in the I thought six. that's the whole conversation today. Right. We're, we, we, we don't talk about the macros and micros. Yeah. We, we, we may get that somewhere along the lines of, you know, your training sure. regimen. But, but, this is, but this is way too important to discuss, mm -hmm. Cheryl. What was that like for you in your 20s during that time? And then when you were going through this septic in the hospital six, six months, what was that intestinal fortitude that you had to overcome that's really hard um in my early 20s it was very difficult because that's when you're building a career that's when you're building friendships and finding relationships and and different things like that and it's supposed to be like one of the best times of your life and it wasn't um I never faulted anybody. I, I never complained about it, mm -hmm. but I had to be more in the background. I, I couldn't be the happy-go-lucky person and say, hey, you want to go to the, the beach right now? I couldn't do that because I never knew when I was going to have an attack or something. So it really did affect my life. And I had to change my career um, in a way. What were you I, doing at that time, Cheryl? At that time, I was, I was in um, computers. Um, mm -hmm. I was a manager. I was an IT manager, but for a company that did a lot of conferences. So we were always traveling. All over the place, right. All over the place, you know, the frequent flyer miles, um, right. going to different states, countries. It was fabulous. I loved my job. I was there like seven years, but um, this disease just took a toll on me and, and I had to give that up. And it was very sad. I, I really missed that part of my life where I could just take off and, and be fun and, and, and all that. Um, so I had to get, I'm still in IT, but it's more behind the desk, not traveling. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what did you, what, what, what was that in your mind that you said, I got to get over this? Was it your children? Was it you combination? Because at that point in your life, you're young, right? Yes. And a lot of people, a lot of individuals may not be mentally strong enough to overcome. Mm -hmm. What was that that had you overcome? I'm not sure of the question. What do you mean? Like just why? So, you... Yeah. How, how did you get over? You're in the hospital for six months. Oh, that. And so, you, and so you had to move forward in your life, right? Yes. You had to move forward in your life. What was that that made you move forward? Well, I'm going to tell you a story about when I was in the hospital. It's, 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 it's going to go a little bit on my religious beliefs. Okay, okay? that's fine. Listen, um, we, we are a safe space here. Yes. We talk about anything you want. I've had a ton of guests on, as you very well know. Yes. And we discuss everything and we do it in a mature fashion. We're adults, so it's all good. Okay, perfect. Well, 
Um, after um, the second surgery, when I went septic, um, the doctors came out and my husband at the time and my mom were there. And the doctor said, I've never seen a case that bad that lived. They didn't expect me to live on the table. Um, and they said, the only thing we can do is let her rest and hopefully she overcomes. I mean, that's all they could do. And my health kept getting worse and worse. And my daily day was, I would wake up, I would stare straight ahead and I'd see the TV and the clock to the left of me was the window. And I would say to myself, I'm going to sit up today. And the only thing I could do was the clicker. That's all I had the ability to do. I could hardly talk. I couldn't mm -hmm. move. I had tubes to show, to tell you, I had a, a tube for the urine. I had an ostomy uh, for number two. I had a nose a tube up the nose. I had a tube in my neck and I had a tube, you know, in my arm. So it was at like five different tubes all over me, taking all the fluids, um, you know, giving me water, that kind of stuff for several weeks. And then there was one day, I remember the same thing. I'm going to get up out of this bed. So all of a sudden, I think it took me eight hours. I actually sat up. Mm -hmm. I don't know what possessed me to get up but i was able to sit up you just said the hell with it <clears throat> i'm this doing is it. it i'm, I'm doing, this doing it regardless of what happens in my life i'm just doing it my stomach I, can I, my, my stomach could just burst didn't whatever care. whatever that is didn't care man didn't care i said i'm well, getting there's a up. there's a northern new jersey term that we say but we can't say here where we say yeah 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 i know and then we just and then we just do it right you know what i'm saying cheryl so I, I sat up and I took my lifeless legs and I flipped them over the side of the bed. So now I'm sitting on the side of the bed and I'm about maybe 120 pounds. I'm thin skin and bones, you know. And back then I didn't have any pictures um, of what was going on. So I'm slumped over the bed and a nurse comes in and she goes, oh my God, oh my God, you know, okay, let, let's get back in the bed because she knows how serious it is. And with every breath I had, I looked right up her, uh, at her, so mean, and excuse my French, I said, I'm fucking walking today, and mm -hmm. you're not stopping me. Mm -hmm. And the look in her eyes was like, oh. And so she disconnected as many things that she could, mm -hmm. and I'm holding on to that um, IV, uh, what do you call it, the stand, the IV mm -hmm. stand. Mm -hmm. And I'm shaking, and I'm shaking. And then all of a sudden I walk to the door and then that door of course is next door to another room. Mm -hmm. At that moment, this is where it became magical. I'm shaking, barely holding on. And this guy comes out with his ID bag and he goes, hi. And all of a sudden my whole demeanor turned from I'm shaking on this pole to Hey, you want to go for a walk? I mean, I just felt great. Mm -hmm. Just like that, something turned. So in my mind, him and I are walking around probably going a thousand miles an hour. But in reality, we're scooching along. And for the first five minutes, we just talked about our condition. And for me, I had to get up. I had to walk so I could live. Unfortunately, he had terminal cancer. I never understood this part, but he was in the hospital to get better so he could go home to pass away with his loved ones. Mm -hmm. I never understood that, but he explained it and we moved on. So the rest of the time as we're walking around the floor, we're talking like we both have hope. He's talking about what he wants to do for the future, what he wants to do for a living, what he wants to do with his family. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm talking about what I want to do. And we're both, I mean, I'm the one who had more hope than him, but we're both talking like there's nothing wrong in our worlds and the future is so bright. Mm -hmm. And that moment, I'm sorry, was just, was just amazing. It, it, it was just so wonderful. So I don't know how long it was we walked around, but then at the end, of course, we went into our separate rooms um, for the night. So the next day comes, I'm feeling good, man. I'm like, yeah. I'm gonna sit up again. And it took me about eight hours. And I finally got up 
And I'm like, I'm going to talk to my friend. So I'm holding on to dear life. I scoot over to the door and I look over and I see a clean bag. I, I just fell to the ground because I knew what that meant. He had gone. He didn't die, but he went home to, to pass away. And, and I, I just fell to the floor and the nurse came over and, and she picked me up and she carried me to the bed. And I, I'm sorry. And, and I kept crying and, and, and she's like, I've got to tell you something. She goes, his family wants to thank you. And I'm thinking for what? And they said, you gave him peace. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I just walked around the, you know, the hospital with them. I didn't do anything. And, they, and she said, you did. Um, and this is where I realized what chronic, chronically ill people need. In our world, everyone is telling us, we got to take this medicine. Um, this is your outcome in life. Um, you've got no hope. You're going to die. You, you, know, you, you understand what I'm getting at. It's always about something. You can never just have a moment to yourself and go, I'm a normal person. I have no disease whatsoever. You never get that opportunity. But that moment, I gave him that opportunity. As we were walking around, we weren't talking about cancer and me almost dying. We didn't talk about that. We talked about the joys in life. We talked about what we want to do. And that gave him an inner peace, they said. And he was so happy. They said they haven't seen him so happy, that happy in so long. And I did that. And, and I did that just being me at my worst moment in life. Mm -hmm. So I gave him an opportunity to be at peace. And he gave me the strength to get up and get out of that hospital. Wow. That and, is an incredible story. And that's moving to me. But on the religious side is what got me up in the first place, okay? And what got me to get up at that same moment that he was coming out? You can't tell me there's no, no higher power that helped move us into that moment. And, and it is in a moment, um, it always makes me cry, I'm sorry. And, and it's something it's that okay. I'm I'm, I'm choked up here too. That, that is an amazing story. And I want to thank you for sharing your story. I want to thank you for being real. And I want to thank you for helping that person because clearly you were instrumental in their life and to help them out. So we'll give everybody a few minutes to get their, you know, Kleenex and, and, and blow their nose and, and wipe their tears. Yes, we're going to smile a little because you got like, like Cheryl said, yeah, you know, humor, humor, humor is okay. Cause that was just an incredible story that you shared. Thank you very much. Where did you go from there? What happened thereafter? You got out of the hospital. What went? Yeah, I got out of the hospital and for the first year or two, it was rough. Um, because I was learning how to live my life without a colon. Mm -hmm. Um, and what they have explain that to us explain what does that mean with, with without that's right when you don't have a colon what they do is they give you a j pouch and what that is is they take your small intestine and they take this the the latter part of it and they make sort of like a ball like a bubble if you will and that directly connects to your anus so when you um are passing stool it gets stored in that little bubble, if you will, but it's very minor. It may be eight ounces, if you will. And um, then when you feel like you have to go, you go to the bathroom, but it's not the same consistency because a colon compacts everything and you know what it is and it makes it hard and stuff like that. This is all liquid um, because it's your small intestine. Mm -hmm. So you're depend like after you eat, you probably have to go to the bathroom within two hours. Mm -hmm. So as bodybuilders, you eat what, six times a day? So you go in the bathroom that many times and you're not gonna get it out all the time, um, the first time. So you're talking about maybe eight to 10 times going to the bathroom. Um, so you, you definitely live by the bathroom a lot. Um, but the good thing for me was I didn't experience the pain anymore until later on another condition happened. But um, in the beginning, it was just the frequency of going to the bathroom, the different 
method. And then you also have to be careful uh, lifting heavy weights because you are you don't have a colon anymore. So there's a lot more pressure that builds up um, since you don't have as many feet of intestines and so forth. Right. I understand. I understand exactly what you're saying. So yeah. where does bodybuilding come into this? When did you, what, what, what is that? Like, yeah, here, uh, my note, my notes for the show are, yeah. Ulcerative chronic colitis, sepsis, not expected to live inspirational. Yeah. And now all of a sudden I want to be a bodybuilder. Were you, were you athletic when you were younger is it just something I'm that very, came I'm to you? Very athletic, yes. I was very athletic, and this disease um, at an early age um, just ruined that for me. Um, so when I was a kid, I loved baseball, basketball, football. I was on many teams. I was always, you know, playing something. So um, when I left high school, um, I joined some softball teams and things of that nature. But once I got the disease, I had to stop all that because – I'd be out on the field and then all of a sudden I got to run to the bathroom for an hour, you know? So there's no consistency for me to Next stay to with, you know, with a sport. So after I got the J pouch, I could kind of time things a little bit better, but here's the caveat to that. Basketball, you're jumping up and down, right? With the J pouch, you feel things more as you're jumping up and down. So when right. you jump up and down more, the stool wants to come out more. So now right, I have sure. something that would be still sports related, but not a lot of high impact, if you mm -hmm. will. Um, so I went a few years trying to figure things out. And then, um, was it 10 years later, um, I started doing, uh, what is it? The P90X, I think it's called at mm -hmm. home. A lot of the home workouts. So I did that for a few years because my kids were young. You know, it's very tough to go to the gym. That kind of thing. Right, right, right. I loved it. I loved it. And then all of a sudden, I, um, a lady at um, uh, school said, hey, you should try out this CrossFit place. It's really good. So I got involved with that. One thing led to another. And they said, you should do a competition. So, so I'm this happy. is. Yeah. It, so, so this is, it just, it was just, it just evolved over, over. It just over time. evolved. I, and when I was younger, I always wanted to be a bodybuilder. I'll be honest. I, I had a little weight set and I would try to lift, but my condition just wouldn't allow it. So I just gave it up for a long right. time. And then back in those days, we had the 110 pound weight set, right? With the flat yeah. bench. Oh, everyone did. Yes. It, it, it was, it was, you didn't have the barbells. You had the sand in there, right? That was. Yes. Those, that, oh, that, that's old school. That is old school. Yeah. So, I'll, uh, so that's really old school, by the way, because yeah, we didn't really have old. the money. We didn't have the money mm -hmm. to buy the regular barbells. We we got the sand ones. Yes. And, and we built our bench. By the way, we built our bench, and um, we used to lift in, um, you know, downstairs on when I grew up on North Ninth Street in Newark and Ampere yeah. Park, William Bloomfield, and in friends' basements, and you know what parents had a basement. And we were, and we were, we were able to go and we were to put that and you, you had to duck anyway, because it was. Oh, because all the beams and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. We, we had, we had to duck, but when we were benching, you can, you can, you can, you can lie down. So, yeah. wow. I mean, when you said I'm going to be a bodybuilder, what division did you think of? I mean, what was that like? I mean, did you sit there and say, I'm going to be a bodybuilder or am I going to be a fitness pro physique? I mean, fitness didn't come to the 2000s. Well, that's that's about the time you were saying, hey, listen, let's let's do this. What was that that said, this is what I want to do? I just enjoyed when I was at, at CrossFit place. I'm not a CrossFit person, but there were elements of bodybuilding along um, with it at this location. And some of the instructors um, did um, compete. So I was observing what they were doing and everything. And it, and it right. really interested me. I said, there's no way in heck I'm doing bikini. I said, I'm too old and I don't have a booty for that. I'm not, <laughs> I, was like, I am not doing bikini. Um, I respect those ladies very highly. It just wasn't for me. So I said, okay, what's the next thing? And they said, um, figure. And since I'm new, I figured that would be perfect um, because I could build some muscle um, and be able to do figure. Mm -hmm. So I did um, my first two shows as figure. And what then, years were those? Uh, uh, 2016. I did two shows in 2016. Mm -hmm. And then in 2017, I decided to go for my pro card. 
-hmm. and I was going to do figure. Unfortunately, that's when I got cancer. So Ooh, that was my next question. That was my next question. Let's go into this. Tell into us, okay. Tell us, tell us about your cancer. Well, what happened was, and um, I've got to send you a picture. I didn't send you a picture of it. In 2016, when I competed, um, I had a girl take a picture of me because of the makeup. And of course, you see, you know, the cleavage and everything. There, you will see a lump. I saw that for two years. I went to the doctor, they did the mammos, they, they did the ultrasounds. They said everything was fine. So here comes 2017, I wanna compete, I wanna go pro, and I got this lump on my chest. It's very, it's very visible. And I'm like, it's gross. So I said to myself- Right, I mean, I mean you're going up on stage, and yeah. if you're in figure at that point, you need to be aesthetically pleasing, if yes. you will. Right. And even if you're even if you're doing the bodybuilding, you have to be aesthetically pleasing. And then yes. you have this lump and you're saying, uh, uh we got to we have to um, we got to We got to We got to look at this further. So I was I went to a breast surgeon because that's where my OB said, if you want to look at it, go ahead to them. But they said, you're fine. You know, the reports, every, blood work, everything, nothing showed anything. So I'm like, all right. So I go to her and go, listen, doc, said so this is gross. Can you cut it out under insurance and let me know what it would take? She immediately looked at me in panic and goes, do you know what that is? I go, yeah, it's a lump. And she goes, no, that's cancerous. I go, really? I said, I've had all these tests done. How do you know this is cancerous? And she goes, and she explained all her years and blah, blah, blah. She goes, I'm gonna have to take you th three weeks out. We're gonna have to do this, this, and this. I said, wait, wait, wait. I just went into contest prep. There is no way in hell I'm stopping because you think I've got cancer. You know, she goes, all right, let me do a biopsy. I said, okay, we'll do a biopsy. Does the biopsy. And um, that Monday, I was supposed to go for the follow-up. And I said to myself, I don't want to drive an hour to here. I'm good. So I call up and they go, no, you need to get in right away. Obviously, I got cancer. So I drive up there, uh, listen to her. And not only do I have breast cancer, I have the worst form, which is triple negative breast cancer. And the reason why it's so um, serious is that all three of them are negative. So there really isn't any cure or any treatment that's standard for triple negative breast cancer. They don't know what to do. So she proceeds to take out this pink piece of paper. And as I call it, she draws the circle of death. We go to surgery, we do chemo, we do radiation. And after about a year, I'm gonna be cured. And I look at her, I take the paper and I shake her hand and I go, thank you for your time. And I walk out the door, like I'm not interested in the car anymore. And they called me up and I said, I just need to think about it. So the following week, she calls me up and she's like, Cheryl, we have to start treatment now. And I said, I'm still thinking about it. I really don't like what you're saying here. And she goes, okay, how about this? How about we just do surgery? I said, I'm down for that. I'm used to having surgery. Let's do surgery. So they do the it's, surgery. It's a starting point at the very least, right? Yeah. You, can, you, can, you can, and then you can figure something out from there, but that's a starting point. That's the starting point. So um, the first surgery didn't take because um, it was under the um, implants. So then we had to have a second surgery to get the rest of it out and the plastic surgeon to come in for implants mm -hmm. um, kind of thing. So we did that. Everything was fine. So the next phase is chemo. And I think this was around May time frame that we said we're going to do chemo because of insurance and, and all that kind of stuff. It wasn't going to be scheduled to July. OK, so this all this time I'm thinking, why do I need chemo? Something in my gut said, why do this? Why do this? So I'm going to the gym. I'm talking to different people and all that kind of stuff. So then I go to myself, Cheryl, stop acting like a victim. Ask questions, figure out what's going on because everyone doesn't need chemo. So I said, all right, I'm a businesswoman. I call them up and I go, how do, how do you know that the chemo is going to fix everything? And they go, oh, we do baselines. I said, great, what's my baseline now? And she goes, well, you have cancer. And she said it very sarcastically. And I said, well, technically I don't because the pathology report now says I'm clear. So 
why do I need chemo? And she goes, because you have cancer. And I go, no. So they do a whole slew of blood work. Can't find a thing. Again, I'm thinking, why do I need chemo? So then I talked to the oncologist and he explains that at this point it's preventative maintenance. And I'm thinking, why do I wanna go through all this preventative maintenance? Because the way he explained it to me is, I could have cancer cells that are dormant at this time. Mm -hmm. And I go through chemo, it wakes up the cancer cells. Doesn't kill them, it wakes them up. So now I've gone through a round of chemo, cancer cells are awake, now I gotta go through chemo again to kill those awakened cells, but I'm already damaged because I've got chemo already. And it just didn't make any sense. So I'm still trying to debate, do I do this, do I do this? So it's the night before I've got to go to chemo and I'm at the gym and a girlfriend runs up to me and says, hey, you got to talk to this lady. Her, her and her whole family have gone through breast cancer. So I'm on the phone talking to her and she's telling me about all the breast cancer she's going on and on and about her sisters and all this. And I'm thinking, why am I listening to this? I really don't want to hear about somebody else right now. No disrespect, but I'm going to go through something very scary the next day is where my head is. So then she goes, she screams to her mother. She, her mother's probably 70 something. She goes, Ma, what kind of cancer did you have? The lady goes, triple negative breast cancer. Shot the hell out. And she goes, you didn't have chemo, right? She goes, no, I didn't have chemo. The doctor said it was localized. She said that triple negative is just like right in the tissue. So they just monitor me. And how long have you been free? And she goes, it's going past 10 years now. So I'm thinking, there's no sign of it in my blood work. It's tissue related. Why the heck? So I called them the next morning. I said, I'm not doing chemo. What was their go, reaction? What was their reaction to that? They were very upset. They said, you have to do it. And I said, no, I don't. Right. And then um, I went to the radiologist and I said, not going to do radiation either. And he was actually um, a cool doctor. Because I said, how effective is radiation? And he goes, after you get diagnosed, there's a six month span. They say it's effective. And I said, well, the plan that was going to be, it wasn't going to be until nine months. So right there, you're telling me it wouldn't have worked anyway. And he goes, probably not. And he was just being up front. Yeah. So I was just so happy with that. So after all of that, I called up my coach and I said, I'm doing a show. And it wasn't because I wanted to win a trophy, but I wanted to show life. You're not getting to me. So instead of like bulking up as you're supposed to normally do, we went right into prep and two months later, I went on stage in October and November. Mm -hmm. And it was like such a victory just being able to get through that. Right. <laughs> Cancer had no idea that they were dealing with several years, right? So exactly. they, 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 had, they had no idea. It had, it had no idea that they were going to get beat. And that's just the way it is. So how'd you do in that show? I did very well. I got like first place in novice. Um, I'm trying to, and in the other show, I got like second in open, um, a couple of second and third places, like masters over 35, you know, over 40. So how, I did, old, yeah. how old were you at this time? At that time, I just turned 50. At that time, you just turned 50 years old. Wow. Lock yeah, going I on. remember, I remember the day of my birthday. Uh, my son, unfortunately, had some issues at school. So um, I'm on the phone with the school talking to them while I'm on the phone with my breast surgeon and my oncologist as the two of them are yelling at, literally yelling at each other of what plan are we attack are we going to do? Because after the first surgery, all the cancer wasn't gone. So they were arguing, should we do a second surgery or should we do chemo first? Mm -hmm. So I got two phones going on with two different <laughs> arguments. And I just fell to the floor and I started crying. I'm like, I can't deal with any of this. Yeah, yeah, and I yeah. just turned 50, you know? And it was like, there's no party, there's no cake. There's just, okay, my son's having issues and I got to decide my life fate, you know, today. And, and it was just a difficult time, but yeah. got through it. Um, thank goodness. And <laughs> all is better now. And, and the way I look at it is some people say, well, you should have chemo, you should have done this that's all good and dandy. But at the end of the day, we're all going to die. Mm -hmm. there, there's no escaping that. So I would rather live the best life for me 
for right. a few right. years, then go through that and, and be sick and, and not live the way I want to because I've had a chronic illness all my life. I've, I've had to hold back so many things because of the illness. I just didn't want to do that again if I didn't have yeah. it. So was bodybuilding freeing for you? Did no, it, it's definitely freeing. Was definitely. it was it was it a freeing experience for you? Like you're in the gym, yeah, and, you, and you're sitting there saying, "I listen." Thus far in my life, I've survived ulcerative chronic colitis, sepsis, breast yep. cancer. You know, I'm going on stage, and you yep. know, I'm going to love the stage. The stage, the stage is going to love me because of what I've been through, and this is going to be for me right is, is that what exactly. you were thinking exactly that's that was the thought I, I, I got I got goose pimples when you said that yeah yeah it's like it's like yeah. yeah because a lot of people see I'm in the bodybuilding world but I don't feel like the typical bodybuilder because my mindset's a little bit different my my drive my passion to go to the stage is a little bit different um than a true bodybuilder. It's more because of the chronic illness and things of that nature that makes me want to overcome and, and get on there. Because people like me, I hate to say it, we don't get a lot of those opportunities. Right. So you want to show those who opportunities? Yes. To do. Oh, there I am. I, I went away there for a second. All of a sudden, this is like, what? <laughs> Where'd I go? I don't know. So, so you're trying to show those who don't have opportunities you have opportunities. You just got to pivot and you got to find them in life. Exactly. And those who have opportunities, you better darn well take advantage of them because you never know when life is going to so throw true. that curveball. You get, you get that Nolan Ryan curveball or fastball. Exactly. It's, it's tough to hit out of the park, but you better hit it once that happens. That's for sure. I want to give um, one um, viewpoint on that. Absolutely. Um, a lot of people that are like in, in, in let's say any sport, bodybuilding, I'll just say bodybuilding because that's what I'm in and they're young. And let's say um, I want to do a show, but it, it's going to be, what, let's say, expensive or, or whatever the case is. So they'll go, why don't you wait till next year um, when you get, you know, your, your act together or whatever. For me, I don't look at that there's another year ahead. Because if you yeah. look at my life, right, if yeah. you look at my life, something has always come up. Right. So when there's an opportunity to get on that stage, I'm going to do it because I'm not like the average person who has that opportunity to right. do it year, year, year after year. Yeah, this is it. It's now. Life is now. There's no tomorrow. Exactly. You no know, move. And I think, <coughs> excuse me, I think this is, boy, we're almost done and we have so much more to talk about, Cheryl. Yes. I'm, ju I'm just looking down at my notes and what I want to ask. So this is part one. We're going to have part two next week. And Sounds great. Yeah, for those of you who are listening in, okay, stay tuned, you know, because this part one is tragedy and overcoming. This, that's, what, that's what this part is, and that's what this is going to be called, tragedy and overcoming. That's going to be, that's going to be part one. That's what this is going to be called mm -hmm. because you've had some tragedies in your life, but you decided not to let that define your life. Exactly. And for those of you who are listening today, if you're not motivated to be the best self, the best version of yourself at this point, nobody can help you. No, I don't want to say it like that, but you know what I mean? I mean, it's, I mean, come on. I mean, you're, you're, you're in bed for six months. It's taken you eight hours to get up. You're meeting a cancer victim a cancer, you know, somebody who's afflicted with cancer and you motivate them. And then sometime thereafter, you have cancer and you sat there and you said, you know what? Uh -uh. It's mm -hmm. not, it's not going to define my life. Wow. You know, I, I, I you know what? Um, as, as my guests say, and as my friends say, I'm pretty good at ending a conversation and bringing it into the next conversation. I'm a little baffled right now on how to end this because I don't want to end it because I feel empty right now because there is so much more. But I think the best thing to do is say, we're going to, when we're off of here, mm -hmm. we're going to schedule right now for next week, part two. And then when part two is done, we're going to release the following week, part one and part two, so that everybody has an opportunity 
to listen in and to make sure that they can download this and they can they can keep it and you can listen to this mm -hmm. on your on your car you know whatever because this is this is a fascinating fascinating story of tragedy and overcoming and, and being here and saying as we do in northern new jersey you know exactly. so, so you know and and saying ain't nobody going to tell me what to do and ain't nobody going to put me down that's how we were brought up by the way yes exactly let me ask you one more question did that sure. did that come into play that your i mean your upbringing did that come into play Definitely. Did that, did that help you along where you're sitting there and you're in your darkest moments and you're saying, no, no, it's not going to happen. That's just the way this is, a is. Whole, this is like an additional conversation, but it comes into mindset and my mindset is so strong and we'll get that on, on the next um, conversation, but definitely my upbringing did have a lot to do with it. I grew up in the streets, you know, the tough environment. And that you were you were you were Jersey City, right? Jersey City. Yeah, I was Newark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't you can't pull the wool over our eyes. That's for sure. No. And if something, if we have something that we have to do, oh boy, boy. Exactly. Once we once once we put our mind to it. So anyway, boy. I mean, I, I think we may have to do a part three because I think mindset is going to be totally one. When at that point, he just, you know, I'm not going to give this part away, but when I was in the hospital in 2020, my mindset came into play and I don't want to say anything else about it. But when you're on your deathbed, you find out what your mindset is like. Ooh. And we'll save that for the next one. Yeah, we're going to save that. And then we have other stuff to talk about. There may be a part three. So, Cheryl, thank you very much from the bottom of my heart. I'm glad that we met and we're becoming friends. Thank you very much for your very personal shares. This is, you know, our, our motto here on Destination Health is to motivate, is to educate and inspire. And you have absolutely done that with me. And I know the listening audience on so many different levels. And I'm going to have my son listen to this, who's 13 years old, who plays hockey. I think this is going to be something that he's going to be listening to because this is real life. And I want to thank you for being on today. Um, just hold on. Don't go anywhere once no we get off because we're going to set up segment number two and then we'll go from there after segment number two. So I want to thank everybody for listening in. Um, if you are listening to this, and we're, we're not live right now, um, but if you're listening to this and you have a comment for Cheryl or for myself, you can put it into the comment section and you can, um, you, you can ask and I'll make sure that Cheryl gets that and so that she can answer. So Listen, everybody that's listening, you know, you can do anything you want. Be the best versions of yourself. Go out there and, and, and kick it hard. And if life's punching hard at you, and I, you know, I'll talk to you about this when we get off. My, my son, yeah. my son, you know, has, has um, some issues, ADHD. And I told him yesterday, life is hitting you. Hit back even harder and, and you'll be all right. So I want to thank everybody for listening. Cheryl, very special person. You are a very Thank special you. person. Thank you very much for being on. And we'll see everybody next week for part two. Thank you very much. Thank you.